Well, hello, I'm Dom, and I'm the host of Horror House, True Crime and the Macabre. Horror House, True Crime and the Macabre is a delectable delight of true crime and the macabre, sprinkled with just the right amount of that dry British humour. Horror House can be found anywhere that you listen to podcasts, and is on Instagram at Twitter at horrorhouse underscore pod, and on Facebook at horrorhousepod. Episodes are released weekly on a Friday, or as weekly as studying full-time and working part-time allows. So why don't you make a brew and come join me as I weave tales of horror and discomfort. Until next time, stay spooky. We're Malice After Midnight, a podcast that focuses on true crime. We want you to feel like you're part of the conversation. And sometimes we deal with pretty dark subject matter. But we always manage to have a good time. She dragged the body into a closet before she bled the body out and cut it into nine pieces. Nine pieces, okay. Now the Christine's following... Christine's counting arms and legs. There's four, <laughs> two arms, two legs. I mean, I'm counting... The head is a piece. Four, five, the cut the body in half. That's six, seven. There's two more pieces. I'm not sure. Maybe she cut the... The feet, two, four, six, eight, ten, nine, and the head, and left the body. So hands, feet, legs, arms, head, head, body. shoulders, knees, and toes, <laughs> knees, and toes. <laughs> <laughs> so check us out. We're Malice After Midnight with Tina, Steve, and Christine. In August of 1980, Carol Bundy confessed her connection to the Sunset Strip Slayer who had been terrorizing Los Angelinos all summer. In September of 2012, the cult of the Unification Church, also known as the Moonies, mourned the death of their leader, Sun Myung Moon. Tune into Murder Murder News every Friday to hear us detangle another twisted tale from true crime history. If you're an amateur sleuth who hopes to someday solve a cold case or locate a missing person, tune into Murder Murder News and start off your search with a deep dive into some fascinating and very solvable cases. We always take a victim-first stance and like to focus on crimes affecting marginalized communities, which typically don't get enough media attention. Subscribe to Murder Murder News wherever you get your podcast to make sure you never miss an episode. I'm Edward October, creator host of October Pod, and we're both listening to Calls of Death on the Darkcast Network. Cause of Death portrays imagery of death, war, and destruction. It may not be suitable for children under the age of 13. Welcome to Cause of Death. I'm your host, Jackie Moranti. Well, I think the rebranding is complete. So there's a new logo floating around, a new name, and fresh life to the show. Please don't forget to rate, subscribe, review, and most importantly, share these episodes with everyone you know. Word of mouth is my best advertisement. There will be one more episode in this series. I'll be talking about Andrew Wakefield and how his skewed research spurred one of the current anti-vaccination movements. It's something that should be highlighted, especially in the current situation. This is another short episode. There really isn't much to say about rubella historically, but what there is to say is rather interesting. So with that, we'll get started with etiology and pathology. Rubella is caused by the rubella virus, which is the only member of the rubivirus genus in the family Togaviridae. 
It is a spherical 40 to 80 nanometer positive sense single-stranded RNA virus with spiky hemagglutinin-containing surface projections. This is the first time that we'll talk about a positive sense RNA virus. How exciting is that? Negative sense RNA viruses have negative electron polarity, and positive sense RNA viruses are, of course, positive in polarity. You learn something new every show, right? The core of the virus is electron dense and is about 30 to 35 nanometers in size. The core is surrounded by a lipoprotein envelope. Unlike other toga viruses, rubella is not known to be transmitted by an arthropod. The natural reservoir are humans. Only one serotype has been identified containing three major structural polypeptides two membrane glycoproteins, E1 and E2, and a single non-glycosylated RNA-associated capsid protein, C. These are housed within the virion. The E1 virion is responsible for viral hemagglutination and neutralization. The E2 virion is responsible for antigenicity. There are two forms of E2, E2A and E2B, and these forms coincide with the different strains of rubella. The virions will mature by budding through the plasma membrane. Rubella is spread through respiratory droplets and contact with fomites. The average incubation period is 14 days. Symptoms begin with a low-grade fever and lethargy in the first one to five days before the rash shows up. Swollen lymph nodes can be present a week before the rash or shortly after the rash occurs. The rash will usually present on the face first, then move down the body. It usually lasts about three days, then most of the time it just fades away and the infection is over. It's often called the three-day measles. Rubella is generally thought to be a mild, self-limiting illness in children and adults. Symptoms vary by age group, with younger children presenting with mild symptoms, rash, and swelling of the lymph nodes. Older children, adolescents, and adults present with the same symptoms, but may be complicated with self-limiting arthralgia, arthritis, and thrombocytopenic purpura. In rare cases, encephalitis may also occur. Many patients are asymptomatic. Most asymptomatic cases occur in patients who have gotten infected more than once. Now, you're wondering if this is another mumps story, right? If this is all there is to rubella, then why is it on the list of perfectly avoidables? Why do we need to vaccinate against it at all? Well, because in pregnant women, rubella poses a whole different threat to the fetus. Rubella is transmitted from mother to baby transplacentally. This often results in destruction of cells and disruption of cell division. The baby will often be born deaf, blind, autistic, or with cardiovascular impairment. Rubella could affect any organ system in the fetus, so many other serious birth defects are attributed to congenital rubella. Many times rubella does cause stillbirth. Rubella was eliminated in the U.S. in 2004 and was eliminated in the Americas in 2009. There are still parts of the world where rubella is endemic, and imported cases are the cause of any reported incidences in the Americas. This is due largely to the 90% vaccination rate in the region. Other rash illnesses can mimic rubella, so visual diagnosis is not reliable. Testing is usually done by PCR. The optimal time for serum collection is five days after presentation of symptoms. If a negative test results, a second test will be performed to confirm the patient is negative for rubella, and this is because false negatives are common. Rubella used to be the final component of the MMR vaccine. More recently, varicella was added to vaccinate against chickenpox, and I'll talk about chickenpox in a future season. I think this one was long enough. The addition of the varicella component has caused contraindications for certain populations who wish to receive the vaccine. 
and I'll talk about that more when I talk about varicella. The rubella component of the vaccine has shown to be 97% effective in prevention of the disease. It is about as perfectly avoidable as it gets. Rubella is still a reportable disease and is traced by both the CDC and WHO. Okay, let's move on to history. Daniel Sennert, a German physician, first described rubella in 1619. He called it rubella, which is Latin for little red, for the distinctive red rash that is one symptom of the disease. It wouldn't be until 1814 that another German scientist, George Matten, recognized that rubella was different from measles. The low-grade fever and lymph swelling were distinct to this disease. They didn't show up in the more serious measles cases. Since most rubella research was initially done in Germany, the name German measles was coined. There you go, Claire. That's your answer to the German connection. Not near as sexy as you thought, right? Not much attention was paid to the disease until 1942 when an ophthalmologist named Norman Gregg noticed that women who contracted rubella in the first trimester of pregnancy had children with cataracts. Several other German researchers took up the torch and found that deafness and congenital heart failure were also defects caused by rubella in neonates. Since rubella didn't have an effect on men who were fighting any war during the years between research, it was mostly ignored as a common childhood illness. Twenty years would pass before a major outbreak would take the lives of many infants and leave even more with staggering birth defects that would shorten the time they had here on Earth. The full scope of rubella on children wasn't completely understood until 1962, when two independent research groups, Parkman, Bescher, and Atrenstein in Bethesda, and Neva and Weller in Boston, isolated the virus from embryonic tissue from stillborn babies. By this time, laboratory techniques had seen great strides and become much more reliable. When samples known to contain rubella virus were inoculated on cultures of African green monkey kidney cells, the virus grew without any effect, but they did excrete interferon. When challenged with an enterovirus, they became cytopathic. This discovery came before the epidemic that would affect millions of babies worldwide. This confirmed isolation of the virus allowed researchers to pinpoint several key features of the disease. One, replication of the virus in the throat for a period of two to three weeks. Two, viremia at high levels, particularly during the second week of infection. This was terminated by the appearance of antibodies. Three, Asymptomatic rubella virus infection in as many as one-third of infected individuals. Four, a correlation between the presence of serum antibodies and resistance to rubella virus infection. Five, viral infection of the placenta. Six, panembryonic infection of fetuses after viremic infections in their mothers. 7. Confirmed rubella during the first trimester of pregnancy resulted in damage in 50 to 90 percent of fetuses with declining percentages through the second trimester. 8. Cell death found in key organs of the fetus, together with inhibition of cellular mitosis and vascular endothelial damage. 9. Excretion of the virus at birth by babies with congenital rubella syndrome, who continued to excrete virus for months, serving as vectors for transmission to others. 10. Seronegativity in approximately 15% of American women of childbearing age, with higher or lower percentages in other parts of the world, depending on social conditions and population density. For instance, women in cities tended to have some immunity built up because they had been exposed to the disease, 
while people who lived in sparsely populated areas were less likely to carry such immunity.